Part three of Old Hampshire Vignettes by Lenoy Faulkner. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part three, chapters eleven through fifteen. Eleven Finmore. One hears the long quivering note of the dabchick. One smells the dank scent of the water weeds when one remembers Finmore, the old old water keeper though bowed with age and lame with rheumatism he was still fresh-coloured bright-eyed and content still absorbed and satisfied by the one great interest of his life the viche he spoke with singular purity the dialect of the valley which his sons speak only in a debased form his grandsons not at all greatly did he confound therewith the strange fishermen whom it was often his duty to attend them he regarded generally with benign contempt and spoke of their achievements in such dark sentences as this i come here and i throwed a line and i've a snarl three boot a bore ees ve and catched nary vish but he was bound to confess that a line thrown however deftly by sons of the valley and masters of the craft might yet be thrown in vain to creatures whose wiles and caprices were a perpetual astonishment to their oldest and most intimate neighbours the outcome of nearly seventy years study of these mysterious beings was summed up by finmore in this brief verdict heartily confirmed by all who pursued them vish is de curiousest thing as is and like all unfathomable things endowed with an irresistible and unfailing charm with more than merely professional ardour so long as he could crawl did finmore pace the sedgy banks and peering through water transparent as the air above it mark the shadowy tails that by the fringes of the dark weed masses waved slowly to and fro he fought in defence of his favourites once fought and conquered too his short and dramatic struggle with a poacher he tersely related thus i'll put ee in water says ee i will willie says i then i put he in water there came a time when for the film that dimmed his eager eyes he could only see to count the largest fish but finmore did not guess what this was or signified with so light a footfall does death draw nigh to some of us he only said there be but few fish in the river but there here vine fish what there be on twelve the sailor in a tiny cottage living-room there once hung a picture imprinted by a fiercer sunlight than that which beats upon these english meadows it depicted a cluster of graves in a foreign cemetery on whose white stones we could detect the english names and verses and foremost of all stood the monument erected as the inscription told us by the officers and men of one of her majesty's ships to the memory of the young seaman who died of malta fever in his twenty-fourth year what it recalled first to most of us was the olive-skinned dark-eyed little boy who swayed by some strain of gypsy blood it may be or in reaction against the sombre though kindly tone of a methodist household in which he was the only child bid fair to be the black sheep of the village or at least the proverbial rolling stone however after for some years scandalizing the neighbors and disquieting his relations one day he took a turn as the scotch say and started upon a new track with determination written in his face and sounding in his step he walked up to what in his eyes was a big house rang the bell and asked to see miss julia standing very erect before her and stiff with resolution as much as with shyness he professed his desire to join her majesty's navy he received encouragement and directions and called once more to say good-bye and tender his thanks on his way to the training ship after that his career was smooth prosperous and above all things steadfast from time to time he appeared in the valley looking swarthier than ever as well as bigger in his coarse blue jersey or coat with the shining buttons afterwards these visits ceased and the postman brought to his home instead 
letters that had travelled days and even weeks to reach it letters dated and stamped with mysterious names which the recipients could not decipher of places to them unknown and inconceivably distant simpler epistles were never written by the pen of a most unready writer saying little save that he was well that he read his bible as adjured to do so that he sent kind greetings to friends and neighbours that there had been a great storm that the heat was terrible that the captain had been pleased with him and yet they afforded that exquisite delight they had even about them that atmosphere of suggestion for which the artist labours as miss julia read them aloud beside the cottage chimney corner the miniature horizon of the listeners widened and to herself came glimpses of wild seas and foreign harbours with a fleeting perception of that continual strain of heart-strings which is part of the cost of a world-wide empire but the day of greatest triumph to all concerned was that of his return after a long voyage when grown impressively tall and even handsome in the dress of a full-blown bluejacket he walked down the village street on sunday afternoon with a train of its admiring youth behind him he was a person with whom one felt proud to be on bowing far more speaking terms and yet as remembered at this his best he was by no means the traditional tar jovial if not rollicking the unforeseen result of his training had been to refine as well as to develop him quite as noticeable as the courtesy of his manner was its quiet self-possession in his fine eyes there was even a shade of pensiveness but perhaps as he was then engaged to be married no less a master than love himself was giving the finishing touches to this education finishing so far as this life is concerned for during his next long voyage the looked-for letters failed and after a long inexplicable pause came one from the far south in a stranger's handwriting with the news that this brief career was over cut short by that invisible foe who more persistently than bullet or blade thins the ranks of our two great armies later was sent the photograph of his grave an inartistic record of an unpicturesque scene a graceless presentation of a fact full of grace for when we remembered by whom as well as to whom the pile was raised that every one from the captain to the ship-boy gave as it were his stone to the cairn thus raising a memorial not only of what was love-worthy in the lad himself but of what was loving and reverent in his shipmates of that tenderness which as dibden long ago sang to us goes hand in hand with the highest daring of all in fact that makes the typical english sailor the darling of the english heart why then we felt that the end of our sailor's poor little story was not such a lame and impotent conclusion after all thirteen the little shop the developments of modern trade had been anticipated in the valley before the universal provider had arisen some of our leading shops catered in the same spirit if not to the same extent one in particular combined with the post office the emporium of the chemist with consequences not always agreeable to captious customers too often it was said the distribution of letters was interrupted because somebody was making up mr anybody's prescription and occasionally that concoction itself was not exactly what had been expected because the compounder was preoccupied about a missing letter as to one annoying habit of the postal staff that consisted in opening interesting-looking parcels in order to examine or perhaps try on their contents and then forgetting before forwarding them to refasten them of this there was forthcoming no more satisfactory explanation than that the postmistress was a widow with a large family it was one of this interesting group doubtless or their equally eccentric assistants who searching one day in an out-of-the-way corner of the shop was heard to exclaim dear me here is a letter for miss blank how did it ever come here 
Perhaps it was his brother who, in answer to a question from a small messenger, "'Please, sir, mother says, is this poison?' replied, "'Poison? Well, not particularly poison.' Admirable, no doubt, was the caution of this statement, though one might wish for a more definite account of something one was actually to swallow, and, moreover, it by no means invariably applied to all the drugs prepared behind that counter. There were some, which, judging from their effects at least, were quite particularly poison. When more than one life had been endangered by these potions, when more than mere patterns had been lost or destroyed by the informal examination already complained of, the impatience of the neighbourhood refused to be any longer stemmed by the plea of the widow and the orphans. They were at last dismissed, and the business divided was in other hands worked henceforth on lines safer perhaps, but unquestionably duller. 14. Mrs. Tally Against our pastoral background the figure of Mrs. Tally showed somewhat strangely. Her appearance, her household arrangements, and her language, when displeased, were disagreeably reminiscent of a town slum, and from thence, indeed, did she emigrate to the valley when her husband accepted a situation as groom in the neighbourhood. Mrs. Tally was never at home in the country, or at one with its inhabitants. Her manner was so unfortunate as to satisfy neither high nor low estranging her equals by its insolence and her betters by its servility to the ladies of the family in which her husband was servant mrs tally was especially subservient and especially displeasing if she met them in the fields or lanes she bowed herself before them metaphorically and actually and by profuse and abject apologies suggested that they resented as a liberty her being out of doors when they much wounded strove to repel this imputation by assurances of their sympathy with her love of exercise and fresh air she replied by incoherent thanks and murmurs as if overwhelmed and rendered inarticulate by kindness and condescension so amazing nor did a further acquaintance induce Mrs. Tally to modify her opinion of these harmless and unassuming gentlewomen, and always her demeanour in their presence might have graced the court of an eastern despot. If, however, in response to fervent invitations, they ventured to call upon Mrs. Tally, the visit was accomplished with difficulty and delay the door fast locked and a death-like silence would imply that mrs tally was not at home but when encouraged by the neighbours they had waited and knocked for a considerable time emerging at last from the recesses of what was truly her castle their hostess unbolted and threw wide the door with exclamations of rapturous delight she would then observe in explanation of this state of barricade that she had been outside doing a little gardening or upstairs doing a little needlework there was something peculiarly unconvincing in these excuses especially the last as the work of that needle was nowhere to be seen was indeed conspicuous by its absence and more credible was the cynical interpretation of her neighbours that mrs tally was thus entrenched against importunate creditors and wisely admitted no one until from an upper window or other coin of vantage she had satisfied herself as to the quality and intention of her visitors for the insolvent condition thus disclosed mrs tally was not wholly and solely responsible it was to be chiefly attributed to the expensive taste that led Mr. Tally to spend so much of his time and his money at the public-house. On the other hand, it was urged by his friends, who were many, that his conduct, though blameworthy, was not inexcusable to those who had seen his home. It did, indeed, leave much to be desired. For one thing, it was strikingly dirty, and that, although Mrs. Tally was continually cleaning it, so she averred, and so in fact it appeared, 
for the boards though grimy were generally damp and sticky as if lately deluged with water under these circumstances comfort was out of the question and ornament was not attempted for by another paradox mrs tally was forever so busy she never had time to do anything not even to mend her children's clothes or the cast-off gowns of benefactors slimmer and taller than herself so that these garments as she wore them gaping at the waist or trailing in the dust or mud behind her completed the domestic picture that was said to drive mr tally to drink and despair yet such are the contradictions of human nature that this almost culpable indifference to externals was combined with a punctilious observance of social etiquette no i was not at the funeral said mrs tally speaking of a deceased friend i should have liked to have gone but i heard it was not fashionable for ladies to go to funerals as a mother mrs tally was pursued by the same untoward fate that frustrated her endeavours as a wife and a housekeeper her little sons bright and intelligent children were the scourge and the terror of the neighbourhood and their capacity for mischief was only equalled by their capacity for lying boldly and directly when confronted with their misdeeds the climax to a long record of scattered game lamed ducks stolen eggs and other injuries was the setting fire to their own house during the absence of their mother mrs tally returned from a shopping expedition to find her cottage in flames the neighbours extricating her furniture and the infant incendiary in his own defence extemporizing a wonderful story of a passing tramp as the actual author of the crime you see ma'am said the village policeman tis dangerous to leave such young children in the house alone i never does cried mrs tally i never does i was but just gone down to the shop for some sugar but i never leaves em in a house by themselves never though naturally much inconvenienced by the accident mrs tally was not insensible to the dignity and interest of her position in a scene so exciting so tumultuous and so crowded with spectators she withdrew as soon as possible to the new abode assigned to her where her furniture had been hastily set down and without an attempt to put it or anything else in order held a kind of leve during the whole afternoon receiving with an air of modest self-consciousness her numerous visitors and their condolences even when these extended to the character of her children mrs tally was able to hear them with the calm and candour of an untroubled conscience i never knew such bad children she said solemnly but it's not my fault i does my duty by em as a mother should i beats em and i flogs em and i bangs em till the blood comes fifteen old thomas the scent of sweet and homely plants will embalm the memory of old thomas for the little thick-set figure with weather-beaten face and small shrewd eyes that his name recalls is best remembered leaning upon his spade or moving with stiff short steps about the box-bordered paths of the garden the garden was indeed his especial domain and that in which he shone to most advantage though far from being the only one in which he aspired to eminence in his quiet demeanour gentle movements and a voice not merely low but reduced by some mysterious form of catarrh to a hoarse stage whisper there was not the faintest suggestion of arrogance nor can he justly be charged with it but there was undeniably some slight approach to that foible in his determined refusal ever to admit that he was ignorant or incapable of anything whatever the habit may have added to his reputation in some ways in others it forcibly detracted therefrom by the embarrassing positions in which it landed him as when for instance he undertook to clip a pony without the faintest notion of how to begin far less complete that delicate task l'audace which can accomplish so many things was here insufficient for the outcome of the whole performance 
and notably of his ingenious and original method of trimming the tail by tying a string round it and hacking at it with a rusty pocket-knife failed to satisfy even the very modest standard of the animal's young and unexacting owners his purely intellectual pretensions were better supported and his complete ignorance of reading or writing was almost elaborately concealed feigning to suffer from that treacherous memory which we learn is the chief result of elementary education he never omitted to insist on receiving a written list of some commodities as he might be directed to procure at shop or at market he wisely supplemented this entirely useless document however by a stratagem closely resembling that adopted by m jourdain with the same object vous savez le latin sans doute oui mais faites comme si je ne le savais pas expliquez-moi ce que cela veut dire in the same manner old thomas though not for one moment suffering it to be suggested or suspected that he could not decipher the list always required the writer to read it aloud to him a mixture of indulgence and sternness characterized his dealings with his employers in administering reproof he was markedly tender of their feelings but with regard to certain blemishes in the appearance of the garden he would vary his accusations according to his listeners to miss mary the maiden aunt he would deplore that our little folk do so paddle about here whereas to the little folk's mother he descanted chiefly on the perverse behaviour of miss mary's little dog but a severer tone was adopted when it came to such momentous questions as the design for the summer garden it was a point which in due season and with marked ceremony he invariably submitted to his mistress invariably also receiving her decision with what she herself called respectful derision and as was plain in the sequel with complete disregard it was perhaps to this combination of opposite qualities that he owed the signal success which attended the bringing up of his numerous children not one of whom became a trouble or a burden either to their parents or the parish it would be instructive to know how old thomas without consulting any of the various modern writers on this erudite subject so distinguished himself in what we are now assured is one of the most difficult of arts but stray hints as to his guiding principles are all that have been preserved to us he was in his social relations professedly select to an extent indeed that must have seriously restricted the circle of his acquaintances to the marriage breakfast of his eldest son thomas's fellow-servants the cook and the housemaid were the only guests invited from a large and eminently respectable village because as old thomas candidly explained he didn't want no riff-raff to this extreme fastidiousness he added a virile grasp of economic truths transmitted to his children in such formulas as this i've always a said to them as you've a shellin o your pocket you've a friend in your pocket and if you ain't you've got nowhere a one end of part three